right, so we talked yesterday about, uh, we finished off with uh, how material heretics are or are not members of the church. The, uh, that's an important distinction to make, and some do not make it. Uh, um, oh, the red pen is gone. Um, uh, Van Nort says all material heretics are outside the church <laughs> Which I, no one agrees with that but he, he's, he doesn't make the distinctions he just says that you know, what do you mean by material heretics so. so number three the function of sanctification which is committed to the church no more than the sanctifying action of Christ as the principal cause does not exclude the free cooperation of men. So, so we're on the whether the sanctification of men is the proximate end of the church. The opinions of the adversaries, Protestants reject the use of men as instruments of salvation, given the doctrine of faith alone and clear and sufficient scripture the ministry of the church seems to be devoid of meaning. So you're on your own. You have faith and you have scripture. So why do you need priests? Except to excite your faith. You, know, you pay them to excite your faith through sacraments and preaching. That's for the Protestant minister. Modernists are of a similar opinion. Thesis, the sanctification of men is the proximate end of the church. Argument one, Christ founded his religion for the sanctification of souls. But Christ founded his religion in the church, which is evident from the preceding article. Therefore, the end of the church is the sanctification of souls. Argument two, from sacred scripture, Christ was sent in order to sanctify men but the church is the instrument by which Christ, as principal cause, continues his mission. So the church is the extension of Christ's mission through time. In that sense, it is the extension of Christ through time. For Christ said to them, As the Father hath sent me, I also send you. Send is mission. The mitere mission. So the mission of the church is the sanctification of souls. Which it does by for sacred doctrine, sacraments, preaching the gospel, etc. That's uh, um, Bishop Gerard de Laurier uh, made that distinction. Oh, the chalk is gone. The, between sessio and missio. The sessio is the, that means the, the session, the sitting, and the missio, that is the act of sanctification. See, that, that I send you to sanctify, essentially. See, so he's saying that the modernists are in possession of the sessio, but not the missio. And it is the missio that gives the authority. Someone, when someone is sent, he has authority, like an ambassador. That's why they call the embassy the mission. So the, the sessio is simply the, the, the matter which receives the missio. The sessio comes from below, the missio comes from above. That, that's essentially his, his distinction. But that, those are the words he uses. So he, he would say, well, there's somebody sitting in the throne of Peter, but he has no authority. There's sessio, but there's no missio. I have chosen you and have appointed you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. 
be from the sanctifying power and offices by which Christ delegated them. These are the power of preaching, baptizing, remitting sin, and of binding and loosing. And you, those are the scriptural uh, references. C, from the divine help given to the church to complete its mission of sanctification. To the church are promised both the permanent presence of Christ, I'll be with you all days, and the Holy Ghost and the divine charisms from St. John, which is words of Christ, pertaining to the church alone, which in sacred scripture is called the body of Christ and the fullness of Christ in those scriptural texts. Argument three from the fathers, all of the, uh, number seven, uh, in the footnote, it is for this reason that non-Catholic religions cannot be means of salvation or even means of sanctification since they lack these very things, that is the mission from Christ, the power and offices which he established, and the divine help. The only thing that they may possess are valid sacraments. But even there, unless they are in invincible ignorance, even there they are committing sins by using them. That's what Pius VI said concerning the constitutional clergy, people bringing their babies to constitutional clergy in France during the revolution. He said, you are committing two sins. You are committing the sin of going to a schismatic priest and you're also committing the sin of having him do something sinful. He has no right to give baptism. He has no right to give the sacraments of the church. So there are two sins. It's Pius VI. See, so the Greek Orthodox, although they have valid sacraments, are not permitted to use them. They are outside the church. So they might be valid in that sense, but do they give grace? You know, and that's that's the disputed. In other words, is there in in say obviously they give grace, but is is there a blockage to the fruit of the sacrament because of some evil disposition? Uh, so the the um, uh, the th that's the question. In other words, is sanctifying grace coming from those sacraments? That's the question. I'm not saying it is. I'm giving you the answer. That's the question. Um, St. Thomas says that, that masses offered outside the church do not uh, give grace. His opinion. Okay, so, because the mass is an act of the whole church. The principal priest is Christ. You always remember that. The principal priest, priest is Christ. So as head of the church, he is offering every mass. The priest is merely an instrument of him. And, and, this, and so is the pope, so is the bishop of the diocese. It's all a, a big chain up to Christ. Right? So every mass, that's why the mass is not a devotion. See, some people think, well, I can go to the uh, Unico Mass and just disagree with it. And they're treating the Mass as if it's a devotion. You see, I, it doesn't matter if we're at the miraculous medal devotions, if the priest is going to come because we can still pray to Mary. That's true. Because there is no ecclesiological problem there. See, anybody can recite the prayers to the miraculous medal. So you, you, but the, the Mass is the Mass of the whole church. So it, is, it is the sacrificial act of the entire church, every Mass, whether it's at a side altar or whether it's in a big cathedral, every single Mass. It cannot be detached from the hierarchy, and it cannot be detached from Christ as the invisible head of the church. And that's why that unicum thing is very, very important. The Mass is not a devotion. <clears throat> so a lot of people say, I'm, I'm, I know, Bergoglio is no Pope, but I can go to the Unicum Mass and just dissent. And I compare it to getting on an airplane where you've paid your ticket and you get on willingly and then you announce to the whole airplane that you disagree where, about where this airplane is going. 
And everyone would say to you, well, why did you get on the airplane? Why are you sitting here? Why did you pay their ticket if you disagree with it? They would say you're a lunatic. <clears throat> so, in other words, the means of sanctification has to come from Christ. And your, the, the church has to be an instrument of Christ. If it's a schismatic or heretical organization, it cannot be a, an instrument of Christ. It has nothing to do with the validity of the sacraments that they are giving out. Even a Jew can baptize, but that doesn't mean that the, that the Jewish religion, therefore, is a means of sanctification. So it's, you have to distinguish those things. But you see Vatican II thinking, well, the Greek Orthodox have valid sacraments, you know, so therefore they're, they're, these churches, they call, they call them churches, are means of sal salvation. Because it's one thing to sanctify, it's another thing to save. It's one thing for the plane to take off, it's another thing for it to land. And it's far more important that it land than it take off. And it land in the right place, not in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> in other words, a means to something has to have all of the power in it and all of the ability in it to bring you to that, to that end. If it doesn't, it's not the means. A half a bridge is not the means to get to the other side because you fall off in the middle and fall down into the Hudson River, if it happens to be in New York. All right? That is not a means to the other side. A means of salvation is everything that possesses the ability to take you to heaven. So just having a few elements, you know, because that's what you know, Vatican II says, well, they have elements, all right? Well, that would be like a, 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 an airplane that has one engine, you know, we're going to go to Europe with one engine, you know, we're going to take off, right? because we have elements. <laughs> How would you feel? You get off that plane right away. If he says, well, you know, the one engine isn't working, but the other one is. And the landing gear is a little iffy, too. <laughs> Might collapse when we land, you know. Uh, the <laughs> you just get off. You'd say, this, I don't know, yeah, this is, you know. But that's what they said. They have elements. You see, they have elements. Uh, so... Argument three from the fathers. All of the fathers hold that it is necessary that men be in the church and that they be sanctified through her. Therefore, sanctification is, pro is the proper end of the church. Proof. St. Ignatius of Antioch. First century. Uh, early part of the second century, actually. God bless you. However, many, <clears throat> led by penance... <clears throat> should return to the unity of the church, they will be of God in order that they live according to Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, my brothers, if anyone should become part of a schism, he does not obtain the inheritance of the divine kingdom. Let Vatican II put that in its pipe and smoke it. All right, so uh, my, my comment is then, how can schismatic churches be means of salvation? <clears throat> St. Irenaeus, God placed the apostles, prophets, and doctors in the church and the rest of the universal operation of the Spirit. They do not participate in these things who do not run to the church. St. Cyprian, we are born of this church, we are nourished by its milk, and we are animated by its spirit. St. Cyprian, he cannot have God, his father, who does not have the church as his mother. Lactantius, this, the church, is the fountain of truth. St. Augustine, only the Catholic church is the body of Christ. He who, therefore, wants uh, to have the Holy Ghost must beware not to remain outside of the church. Now, compare Vatican II. It follows that the separated churches and communities as such, though we believe them to be deficient in some respects, 
have by no means been deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation, for the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the church. I mean, do we need to say any more? That is the heresy that non-Catholic religions are means of salvation. One, one of the big heresies. And it, it's pivotal in Vatican II because ecumenism is the, the message of Vatican II. It was called for ecumenism. That's why they had to do religious liberty because you can't do ecumenism by telling your uh, fellow members of the Council of Churches, oh, oh, by the way, you don't have the right to exist. You don't have the right to promulgate. You don't have the right to adhere to your religion. See? And also, you can't tell people that, that you're trying to be ecumenical with that, oh, you, know, you only have one engine and no landing gear. You're, you're never going to make it. You are leading people to hell. Because if you're not leading them to heaven, you're leading them to hell. You're a means of damnation. You're not a means of salvation. Objectively speaking, the only way that they can, that people in those religions can save their souls is by the condition of invincible ignorance, and secondly, by fulfilling all of the requirements for what we call baptism of desire, and th at least implicit desire to be in the true church of Christ. It's the only way. And the, those religions are in many cases obstacles to that. In certain cases, they help it by at least some adherence to, to truths. They help it in a certain way, but in many other ways, they are obstacles to it. So, uh, ar uh, Archaeology teaches this holy function of the church expressed in inscriptions, and you can look in the book for that. If you have the book. <laughs> but it, it's... He's big on the archaeology. So you can, you know, I don't think, it, you know, whatever. Uh, you can look, the book is in the library. Uh, the corollary, corollary one, since the end of the church, that means the purpose of the church, is spiritual and supernatural, it follows that the church is a spiritual and supernatural society. It is not merely some human organization. Corollary two, since no one but a sanctified person is able to attain beatitude, and since sanctification is found only in the true religion of Christ, it follows that the church is a necessary society. If there's only one plane leaving Afghanistan, you better be on it, in other words. Corollary three, the church ought to be loved, for the church is the holy city of the, this is Leo the Thirteenth of the living God, born of God himself, and by him built up and established. Upon this earth, indeed, she accomplishes her pilgrimage, but by instructing and guiding men, she summons them to eternal happiness. We are bound then to love dearly the country whence we have received the means of enjoyment this mortal life affords, but we have a much more urgent obligation to love with ardent love the church to which we owe the life of the soul, a life that will endure forever. For fitting it is to prefer the good of the soul to the well-being of the body, inasmuch as duties toward God are of a far more hallowed character than those toward men. Objections. Objection one, it is necessary that men be sanctified before they be incorporated into the church. Therefore, sanctification, since it precedes, does not seem to be the proper end of the church. I the response, I distinguish the antecedent. Men must be previously sanctified before they are incorporated into the church. Improperly, I concede. Properly, I deny. Sanctification properly is the infusion of grace, the washing from sins, and the confirmation in good. 
sanctification improperly is said to be those dispositions by which man is prepared for faith and justification. So you can't just walk into a church and ask for baptism. You have to be catechized and your sincerity must be proven, etc., that you have the dispositions to receive baptism. And that is improperly sanctification or, or inchoate sanctification, you might say, the beginning of sanctification. These dispositions ordinarily precede in time incorporation in the church. But through baptism, men are both adopted as sons of God and at the same time become participants in the unity of the church. So the principal effect of baptism is the removal of original sin, and uh, by that, uh, you become uh, members of the Catholic Church. So any valid baptism gives you membership in the Catholic Church, uh, even of infants in Protestant sects and in um, Orthodox, etc., they are full-fledged members of the Catholic Church until such time as they achieve the age of reason, and then they are presumed to be members of the sect in which they are raised and therefore are outside of the church. But the effect of any valid baptism is incorporation into the Catholic Church. Um, instance, holy men are not obtained for the fact that they are members of the church, but, but because they are holy. Therefore, they should be considered members of the church because they are holy. In other words, just being a member of the church doesn't make you holy. So, really, you should not consider whether or not they're members of the church, but rather, or rather whether they are holy or not. That's the objection. <clears throat> Response, the entire reasoning limps. Men are neither sanctified by ecclesiastical communion alone, nor are they incorporated into the church for the fact that they are holy. See, so just by being Catholic doesn't mean you're holy, and by being holy doesn't mean you're Catholic. But men must be sanctified through the church together with the cooperation of their own free will. So any sanctification of human beings, be it by valid sacraments, be it by the grace of Christ, whatever it is, is always through the instrumentality of the church. Instance, okay. Objection two, the faithful desire eagerly to be united to Christ through religious life. But if the sanctification of men is the purpose of the church, no immediate union with Christ is had. So this is a very typical Protestant objection that the church is a type of obstacle between the individual and Christ. Response, I distinguish the major. This union is excluded by the church, I deny. It is affected by the church, I subdistinguish. Instrumentally, I concede. Principally, I deny. So he's saying that the church is the instrument of this union with Christ, but Christ is the principal author of it. Likewise, I distinguish the minor. There is no such thing as an immediate union. Secundum quid, I concede. Simpliciter, I deny. Christ in the supernatural order uses the church as a condition and instrument subordinated to himself for the purpose of sanctifying men. <clears throat> In the same way, in the natural order, secondary causes are used by God by which he grants to them a certain participation in the divine activity. Simpliciter, however, we do reject an immediate union with Christ, for we are members of one body of which Christ is the head, and faith and charity regard God as their proper object. In the first place, however, <clears throat> charity joins men to God. <clears throat> St. Thomas says, For the beloved is in a certain way in the lover, and also the lover by his love is drawn to a union with the beloved. For this reason it says in St. John, He who abides in charity abides in God and God in him. 
and we uh, there's a footnote that we uh, from uh, St. Thomas uh, that we did not do. Uh, this is from St. Thomas with the references at the top of the page, uh, Tertia 39, Article 8, etc. Priests are consecrated for the purpose of celebrating the sacrament of Christ's body. Now, that th that is the sacrament of ecclesiastical unity. According to the Apostle, we being many are one bread, one body, all that partake of one bread and one chalice. Moreover, by baptism, man becomes, this is St. Thomas, a um, uh, par participator in ecclesiastical unity, wherefore also he receives the right to approach our Lord's table. Consequently, just as it belongs to a priest to consecrate the Eucharist, which is the principal purpose of the priesthood, so it is the proper office of a priest to baptize, since it seems to belong to one and the same, to produce the whole and to dispose the, the part in the whole. Right? So that's, again, emphasizing the Holy Eucharist and therefore the Mass as the, the uh, principle of unity and, and sign of unity of, of the Catholic Church. So, all right. Um, so, objection three, the Christian religion consists in a love for God, but there is no need for a church in such a love. All right. Response, I distinguish the major. The Christian religion consists in part in that love I concede, but totally I deny, and I distinguish the minor. There is no need of a church as the form of the love I concede, but as a certain cause of this love I deny. And so the, uh, the true religion consists in this, that we serve God according to the divine law. But it has been proven that the Christian religion has been established by Christ, who is God, in the form of the church. Therefore, he who wants to have God for his father must have the church for his mother. For in very fact, the love of God resides formally only in the soul. See, so that, that is done by God through grace. The church does not produce grace. It is the instrument of grace, however. But the church under Christ is the instrumental cause which begets and nourishes such a love. Instance, for a mediator... We need no one else besides Christ. Therefore, the church is useless. That's typically Protestant. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. We need no mediator besides Christ. As the meriting and saving mediator, I concede that we are in no need of a mediator applying his merits and salvation, I deny. See, that's the, the role of the church is the application of the effects of the redemption. I always use this example. The German prisoners of war, World War II were given by the Americans cans of food, but there were no can openers. <laughs> Not deliberately, it just <laughs> nobody had any. So it's one thing for the merits to be in the can. It's another thing to open up the can and eat what's inside. So the application is different from the deposit, you might say. In other words, the deposit of the merits is done by the cross of Christ. The application of the merits is done by the church, and that's why you, are, you will be priests, is the application of the merits of Christ through the Mass, through the sacraments, through your preaching, through your good example, your catechesis, your counseling. All of these things are effectively Christ operating his church and, and applying the merits. And the same with the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's her relationship to the church. She applies the merits of Christ by being mediatrix of all graces. So, so that's, and that's the will of God, that there be the Virgin Mary and the church and priests to do those things. That's his will. That's the way he wants to do it. He could have done it any other way that he wanted to. But that's the way he wants to do it. So that it makes the path to salvation extremely easy. You can always go back to your mother. 
right? No matter what trouble you're in, you can always go back to your mother. So the Virgin Mary is there as, as an easy path of salvation to sinners. And uh, the same thing with the priest. So, you know, the, uh, it is, uh, he didn't send angels to distribute the sacraments, you know, these alien beings, so to speak, to distribute sacraments, priests, but priests who are sanctified, obviously. See, so a, a sanctified priest can do an enormous amount of good. The like Curie of Ars, for example, or you know, great Charles Borromeo, St. Alphonsus Liguori, I mean, we're still reading their works, we're still imitating their virtues. I mean, the, the, it's a general principle that good example is far more powerful than bad example because there is a tendency to good in human beings in the sense that despite original sin, they, human beings still want to be good. And they are attracted by good. So, uh, you know, a, a, a sanctified priest can do an enormous amount of good. And vice versa. A bad priest can do an, an enormous amount of evil. Think of all the heretics and whatnot. So, Objection 4, it is read in Acts 10, and Peter opening his mouth said, in very deed I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh justice is acceptable to him. From this it is obvious that sanctification has been confided to no church. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. God is not the respecter of men inasmuch as he calls to the church all peoples, I concede, and let the French hear that, in the sense that he excludes any church whatsoever, I deny. So I had a whole lecture when I was in France uh, on the fact that the French have a special vocation from God. And, and so I said the, to her, the, the time of an elected people is gone. That there is no, that the, you know, the church is the elected people. The church is the successor to Jerusalem. Oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, it's, uh, the, you know, we have the divine mission. And then I explained to her that since Philip the Fair in 13 something, early 1300s, slapped the face of the Pope, uh, that France has given the church nothing but grief and horror. And, and that really is not a single page of French history in which the church is not in some way molested and persecuted by, 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 the, by France. I even pointed that out to her. Well, that's because of the, like, it's like the Jewish people who rejected, you know, and were, <laughs> there's a response for everything. But they have this idea that they are the elected people, the populus electus. So I uh, had a little argument with her. <laughs> Well, not only is it absurd and based on all sorts of really spurious uh, revelations, private revelations, but also it is, it borders on heresy if it, it's not actually heretical. I mean, it's very, it's proxima heresy to say that there is an elected people in the New Testament. My goodness. Yes? The what? Midbrennan de Zorga, yeah, the, uh, uh, well, that's a little different. This is a theologically elected people. It's just like the, the, the Jewish people of the Old Testament. They are the successors to that elected people, and they have a divine mission. For 800 years, they've been a little derelict in their mission, though. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the, and France has contributed a great deal to the faith, and, and, uh, missions and all sorts of theology, every, all sorts of things, culture, everything. But uh, as a nation, it has persecuted the church since the late Middle Ages. 
So right, let's talk about the Third Republic, maybe. The the uh, uh, so uh, response. I distinguish the antecedent. God is not the respecter of men, inasmuch as He calls to the church all peoples. I concede in the sense that He excludes any church whatsoever. I deny. The response is clear from the context, for it concerns the centurion Cornelius. Cornelius was the Roman centurion who uh, sent a, an envoy, a soldier, to St. Peter saying, uh, and you'll get that in that book, uh, the, um, I, you know, I need somebody to come and, and teach me the faith and baptize me. And that's when St. Peter, before that soldier knocked on the door, St. Peter had the vision three times of this, this basket or, or whatever it was of all of these insects and horrible things that the Jews considered unclean to eat. And, and St. Peter had to be convinced. So <laughs> three times he got <laughs> the vision. And, and he finally understood. And then the knock came on the door <laughs> after the vision. And, uh, and so that was Cornelius. That was the... And, uh, so uh, I think he's canonized, actually. I think so. Uh, he, however, be because he was found acceptable to God, was called to the church in order that he obtain a greater abundance of grace and virtues. See, that's uh, St. Thomas talks about that. Here it is. As stated above, man receives the forgiveness of sins before baptism insofar as he has the baptism of desire, Okay. <laughs> Explicitly or implicitly, and yet when he actually receives baptism, he receives a fuller remission as to the remission of the entire punishment. So before baptism, Cornelius and others like him receive grace and virtues through their faith in Christ and their desire for baptism, implicit or explicit, but afterwards, when baptized, they receive a yet greater fullness of grace and virtues. Hence, in Psalm 22, verse 2, he hath brought me up on the water of refreshment, a gloss, that means a, a commentary on, this, on the marginal commentary. He has brought us up by an increase of virtue and good deeds in baptism. And my comment is antiphene. See, you can go to your baptism already in the state of grace if you posit certain acts which dispose you to that, and that you can do in de gratia and all of that, but the certain acts whereby through baptism of desire uh, you and contrition for sin and various other certain, that you believe certain articles of faith, etc., uh, by supernatural faith, you can achieve justification before baptism, and Ugo mentions that too. That's key to the whole Fenian thing. If you can achieve justification before baptism, Fenianism is dead. Right. So that's a, but they consider Saint Thomas to be a material heretic. Saint Thomas is, Saint Augustine is, Saint Ambrose is, Pius IX is, and Saint Alphonsus Liguori all material heretics. To them. Yes. <laughs> yes. Then they, according to Van Nort, they would all be outside the church. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but that, I, know, I know the Feeny, and you can't argue with the Feenians. Somebody told me that somebody drove in the other a week or so ago and said that I'm a heretic. Just, just. Who was it that? He's, oh yeah. Okay. And yeah, that I was a heretic. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I'm only material though. <laughs> you see, but that's key if you're arguing with 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 uh, Fenians. That's key. Can you achieve justification before baptism? That's the key question. And they would say no. Before baptism of water, it's impossible. But it obviously, it is possible. Right, so, and Saint Augustine said that the that Cornelius, unbaptized, was in better condition than Simon, who was baptized. This is Simony. Saint Augustine said that. 
So, uh, for this reason, Cornelius is ordered to seek out Peter at the angel saying to him, send therefore to Joppe and call hither Simon, who is surnamed Peter. He lodgeth in the house of Simon, a tanner by the seaside. So that's in the Acts of the Apostles. Yes. Simon, who was in a state of sin because of his simony, even though he was baptized, is in the state of sin. That Cornelius, yet unbaptized, was in better condition because he had already achieved justification. The Simon, who is well known for simony, he wanted to buy from the apostles the ability to confirm. Yeah. I think that's the same, yes. Simon Magus, yes. He went to Rome and uh, became a, uh, a personality for doing magic things in Rome. Yeah, that's true. Under Nero. It was like a, a show. No, is there a question back? No. <laughs> All right. Instance, only God causes grace. Therefore, sanctification... Uh, since it is the effect of grace, does not depend on the church. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. Only God causes grace principally. I concede instrumentally. I deny. The church is the instrument which Christ ordinarily uses for the sanctification of men. Hence, the operation of the church cannot be separated from Christ. Leo XIII recalls this in these words, For the only begotten Son of God established on earth a society which is called the Church, and to it he handed over the exalted and divine office which he had received from his Father to be committed through the ages to come. As the Father hath sent me, I also send you. Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world." Consequently, as Jesus Christ came into the world that men might have life and might have it more abundantly, so also has the church for its aim and end the eternal salvation of souls, and hence it is so constituted as to open wide its arms to all mankind, unhampered by any limit of either time or place. Preach ye the gospel to every creature. Right. So the... Uh, but it, that does not prevent God from justifying a soul before baptism. He is not bound to the sacrament of baptism. He can do whatever he pleases. But still, you must Im desire, at least implicitly, to belong to the true church of Christ in order to be saved. At least implicitly. That that's means you, you belong to the church in voto, and that is sufficient for salvation, given certain conditions, principally that of invincible ignorance. Very important to get all those distinctions correct. <clears throat> so, um, instance, if the church has as its end the sanctification of men, then they would lack sanctification who are outside the church. I distinguish the major. If things were such that sanctification would be the proper end of the church according to an exclusive law of providence, I concede. According to the ordinary law of providence, I deny. Catholics profess that it is possible that God provide extraordinary means of sanctification to those who are invincibly and materially outside the church. So that's antiphene. I have a footnote here, but I can't see where... Oh, okay. Instance, it is abhorrent to the notion of divine providence that A, heretics, and B, infidels, be completely deprived of the means of sanctification. But from the thesis, it follows that all such people lack these means. Therefore, the sanctification of men is not the proper end of the church. Response, setting aside the major, I deny the minor and the conclusion. A, that providence does not exclude from sanctification the hope of eternal beatitude, heretics who, are, who err in good faith, is the common teaching of doctors, as I said. And that's antiphene. 
So St. Augustine said, He is a heretic, in my opinion, who for the sake of some temporal comfort and very great glory and power either concocts or follows false and new opinions. He, however, who believes men of this type is a man who is deluded by some imagination of truth and piety. Concerning heretics, the Church teaches these two things, Pope Pius IX said, for it must be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman Church no one can be saved. So that sinks Vatican II. Right? That this is the only ark of salvation. So that's why Vatican II is a heresy. This He says it's a faith. For it must be held by faith. That means that is a solemn statement that he who shall not have entered therein will perish in the flood. But on the other hand, it is necessary to hold for certain that they who labor in ignorance of the true religion, if this ignorance is invincible, are not stained by any guilt in this matter in the eyes of God. Now, in truth, who would arrogate so much to himself as to mark the limits of such an ignorance because of the nature and variety of peoples, regions, innate dispositions, and of so many other things. All right, so notice it must be held for certain. <coughs> so you have to hold it. That's why we refuse sacraments to Phineites, because they are disobedient to this. And look at the footnote, Pius IX also said in the encyclical Quanto Conficiamur Merore of August 10, 1863, and here, beloved sons and venerable brothers, we should mention again and censure a very grave error in which some Catholics are unhappily engaged, who believe that men living in error and separated from the true faith and Catholic unity can attain eternal life. Indeed, this is certainly quite contrary to Catholic teaching, notice that. It is known to us and to you that they who labor in invincible ignorance of our most holy religion and who, zealously keeping the natural law and its precepts engraved in the hearts of all by God, that's from St. Paul, and being ready to obey God, live an honest and upright life, can, by the operating power of divine light and grace, notice that it's not by their own natural virtue, attain eternal life since God who clearly beholds, searches, and knows the minds, souls, thoughts, and habits of all men because of his great goodness and mercy will by no means suffer anyone to be punished with eternal torment who has not the guilt of deliberate sin. So in order to go to hell, you have to commit a deliberate mortal sin and be unrepentant of it. If you are in invincible ignorance, you cannot commit such a sin of infidelity because you don't know. One of the conditions of mortal sin is sufficient knowledge. So you won't go to hell for that. You might go to hell for something else, but you won't go to hell for that. That's what he's saying. But the dogma that no one can be saved outside the church is well known. And also those who are, and notice that, the dogma, it, it, he says in Latin, Notissimum Catholicum Dogma. That's how the Latin reads. A most well-known Catholic dogma. So he's, he's making both things very clear here. That the Catholic Church is the only means of salvation, but that those who are outside of it through no fault of their own may, if they have the proper dispositions, attain eternal salvation. And the proper dispositions we won't go into right now. That's, and also, those who are obstinate toward the authority and definitions of the same church and who persistently separate themselves from the unity of the church and from the Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter, to whom the guardianship of the vine has been entrusted by the Savior cannot obtain eternal salvation. So it's all clear. So that 
that doctrine condemns both Vatican II and the Fenians.